Okay, hey everybody. Uh, so I'm Anthony. We're going to talk about subinterpreters in Python 3.12 and also look a little bit forward into the future. Uh, before we get into the talk, a um, couple of things. Uh, a couple of things about me. Okay, so a few links. Uh, that's my uh, website where my blog is, links to talks I've done previously and stuff like that. Um, I'm on Twitter, uh, Anthony PJ Shaw. I'm also a Mastodon uh, on the Fostodon instance. Um, that QR code, which will be on the last slide of this talk as well, has uh, some links as well as copies of the code snippets that I'm going to show during this talk. So, we're going to talk about subinterpreters and parallel computation in Python in this talk. And uh, I've got an analogy that I've been working on, and I'm not quite sure about it. So uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk through this analogy. Hopefully, it's going to help us, because when we talk about subinterpreters, it's really important uh, to consider the time it takes to create them and to serialize tasks. So to uh, give you an idea, uh, this, is an, this is a concept that uh, we have an individual who needs to review three books. So that's their work that they have to do. Uh, they've got two friends, and if they review a book uh, by themselves, it takes 60 hours. So if they review three books, one at a time, it would take them 180 hours. So you might think, okay, can we do this computation if the person is a CPU? and we've got three CPUs, can we do the computation in parallel? So what would it take for three people to review three books? So you think, OK, that should take 60 hours. So if this were a math question, that's probably the right answer. Uh, this is a computer science question, so that is the wrong answer. Um, the reason it's the wrong answer, in my analogy, is because they have to package the book, they have to ship the book, and then the person receiving the book has to unpackage it. So I'm going to give you another example of this. I've got uh, three pieces of paper here. Um, I am CPU zero, um, so I'm the main CPU. I'm busy because I'm giving a talk. Um, I've got some work to be done, which is to fold these pieces of paper twice. Uh, and I need um, some volunteers from the audience, if you put your hands up. So I want you to fold it half and then half again, OK? One, one volunteer, two volunteers. OK, right, go. Uh, so. OK, and then when you folded it twice, come and give it back to me as well, because I need the result. Um. <laughs> OK, so in that example, we had our parallel computation. Was that quicker? <laughs> no. Why was it not quicker? Because it took me longer to run to the person. <laughs> so we'll actually we'll talk about the, uh, what would be the fourth CPU uh, a bit later in the talk, um, which is, I guess, uh, the, the long pole in the tent. There's other words for it, but yeah, it's the, the slowest one. So uh, the actual time for the three people is the packaging, um, the shipping, the unpackaging, and the review time. So this does relate to some real scenarios, but it's really important to consider this. So the, the actual CPUs themselves are all more or less the same. We saw that one of them was a bit slower, but um, it takes me the same time to fold the piece of paper twice as it would somebody else. OK, so the thing doing the job was the person in this analogy. The work to be done was the stack of books or the pieces of paper. Uh, and the interworker communication was me running with the task, giving it to the CPU, and then the person bringing back the result. That part is really important, and that's actually one of the most important things 
when we look at sub-interpreters. So a couple of questions. Um, so our book editor has a fourth person to review books. Would that shorten the time to review three books, assuming that you can't cut a book in half? What do we think? Show of hands for yes? OK. Uh, our editor has decided to ship the books by plane. Would that shorten the time to review three books? So instead of shipping them by truck, uh, they're going to ship them by plane. Do we think that would be quicker overall? Mostly yes. We've got some nods. OK, good. So let's relate this back to Python. Um, so in Python, we have uh, a few options. And I've included sub-interpreters, because that's what we're here to talk about. Um, at the moment, when you want to run things in parallel, uh, we have a few options. There is a difference between parallelism and concurrency, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but when you want to run things at the same time, let's use a non-technical term, um, you have some options. The first option is threading. Uh, and I've put a star there, because it's parallel, but kind of, we'll talk about that. Um, Coroutines uh, with things like async IO, which is great for concurrency. Uh, Multiprocessing, has anybody used multiprocessing before? OK, quite a few of you. OK, great. Um, Multiprocessing is properly parallel with Python. Um, and then sub-interpreters. So the third column along is the startup time, which is important. Um, so the fastest uh, is coroutines, uh, then threading, then sub-interpreters, and then multiprocessing. And I'll put some numbers behind this as well and actually show you to what extent that's true. Um, also, the data exchange is really important. So in the case of the folding the pieces of paper or the book, um, we're not, in the case of the book, uh, we're not reviewing the same book at the same time. I've actually got to go and give you the book. Uh, and it's the same with uh, multiprocessing uh, and sub-interpreters. You have to package the data to send it to somebody to look at. Um, so threading is great for, and coroutines, uh, are great for small IO-bound tasks. So IO-bound would be things like sending data over the network, reading and writing from files, uh, things that need some kind of IO activity. It's great for concurrency or parallelism in those jobs. Um, Multiprocessing and sub-interpreters are better suited for CPU-bound tasks. So if you've got a workload on Python and you've built an app and you've noticed that you've got a four-core CPU, uh, and what I would love to show this GIF, but I'll put it in the link. Uh, it's a breakdancer who's CPU zero and everyone else standing around clapping, which is CPUs one, two, and three, and four. Um, just three, actually. Um, so if you have CPU or IO bound tasks and you want to run things properly in parallel, we've got other options. So here's a small, simple diagram um, to demonstrate the difference between concurrency and parallelism. So in concurrency, uh, you can start multiple tasks at once, but only one of them is truly actually executing at any time. Um, in parallel, multiple can be executing. So when we say executing, this is from multi-core or multiple CPU environment. Multiple CPUs or multiple cores are actually doing work. So uh, I had a star next to threading. So let's talk about uh, an example of where you would hope to get a performance gain from using threading. Uh, if you've used threading in other languages, you would probably expect the implementation we're going to show to be faster. Um, so in Python, our task is uh, for every integer in a vector, calculate the distance to 50. Uh, and we're going to generate um, random numbers between 0 uh, and 100. Um, we're going to generate 100,000 of them. And my crude implementation is to loop through each number and then work out how far that number is from 50. So um, that is a linear problem. Um, could we make this faster by chunking that information and then doing it multi-threaded. So in Python, I've got two implementations. Uh, the first one is the crude one that I showed you. So F linear is the just go through a loop. And then my second implementation is F threaded, where I'm going to split it up into 100 chunks. And then for each chunk, I'm going to start a thread, start all of the threads at the same time. Uh, and then each one is going to calculate their answer. And then I'm going to wait for them all to finish. OK, so uh, show of hands, who thinks implementation two would be faster? All right, this is a good audience. Uh, it's twice as slow. Um, 
So a few things here that's going on. One is that there's a lock in the interpreter. So even though you've got multiple threads running, they're all running in the same interpreter. And they're running kind of concurrently, but they can't run at the same time. Um, so this lock is what subinterpreters are about. Uh, and it's basically about moving the lock so that you can have things running in parallel um, in threads as well as in subinterpreters. So what is a subinterpreter? So it's an API for creating two or more interpreters in the same Python process and then running each one in parallel. It's part of the effort to make Python better at running parallel code. Uh, it's developed by Eric um, on the fastest C Python team. Uh, Eric works at Microsoft. Um, and this work, and I added this last week, PEP 703, if anyone's heard about this no gill discussion and it's been going on for a couple of years now, um, this does contribute towards the no gill effort. It is not a competing implementation of no gill. Um, they do work hand in hand. And one of the reasons for that is because I'd say a large chunk of the work to make subinterpreters happen has actually been removing global state from C modules. Um, and that needs to happen anyway. So it's great that Eric's had a head start and other people have been testing this. So if we get to give you a system diagram for Python 3.11 and below, uh, at the top you have the Python process. Uh, underneath that you have uh, it's really a data structure, but something called an interpreter. And then underneath that you can have threads. So when you have, uh, you have one of each by default. So you've got the main process, you've got the main interpreter, and then you've got a thread. Um, when you're running in Python, you can start multiple threads, but they're all running in the same interpreter. Um, the gil is the global interpreter lock. Um, it technically belonged to the interpreter, not the process, but there was no way to have multiple anyway. So for the sake of simplicity, the gil, the lock, belongs to the Python process. Um, when you use multiprocessing, you're basically starting multiple processes. So with subinterpreters, uh, that lock, the thing that only lets one thing run, um, now belongs to the interpreter. And you can start multiple interpreters in the same process. So in the case of our threading example, um, if you were to start uh, Yellow means running, I guess. Um, so on the right-hand side, in that example, you can have two threads executing code on different CPUs at the same time. So if we were to re-implement our NumPy um, distance to 50 algorithm and use the same threading example, but have multiple subinterpreters, it would be faster. So how would you use a subinterpreter in Python 3.12? Okay, first of all, you have to, imp you have to import a super secret module uh, called underscore XX subinterpreters. Um, in most of my examples, I've always aliased it to interpreters because otherwise it looks ridiculous. Um, the reason it's called underscore XX subinterpreters is because you're not really supposed to be using it yet. Um, it is mostly there for testing purposes uh, as, as ex an experimental interface. Um, the other thing you might notice is that, um, uh, well, first of all, this is a blocking call. You wouldn't notice that. But when you run the Python code, that code is a string. Um, now, writing Python code all in strings is not much fun. It's hard to use an editor. Um, you might think, OK, I've got a function already. How do I tell it to run that function? But you've got to copy the code of that function and, and convert it into a string. So at the moment, the API for subinterpreters is pretty basic, um, but it's going to improve soon. So the Python interface of subinterpreters for 3.12 is really a sketch, and it's mostly for testing. Uh, I'll talk about what that will look like in the future uh, in a second. Another thing to note is that when you call subinterpreters.run, that is a blocking call. So that's not running asynchronously. It will uh, hold the process that you're calling it from. Um, so it's not doing anything in parallel, it's just running it. Um, if you want to do things uh, concurrently, um, then you would start an interpreter from a thread. 
And I know in my diagram I had the threads underneath the interpreter, but we're actually using a thread to start an interpreter. And the reason we do that um, is because um, we can basically create proper parallel examples. So you would create a thread, um, and then you would ask it to run interpreters.run, and then give it the code to execute. OK, so that is the current API. Um, the proposal that might be in 3.13 um, is that you would have things like a function that you've defined in Python code, and you'd ask it to run the function in a sub-interpreter. So that's a lot easier to use than strings. Um, so accept a callable, similar to how threading, the, th the threading in face works at the moment. Um, another thing that should happen in the future as well, hopefully in 3.13, is a uh, executor context manager. If anyone's ever used one of these for threading pools, uh, you create a pool of threads, you have a, a series of work to be done, and then a pool manager kind of manages which task to give to which thread. And then if one thread finishes, it gives it the next task, and it basically goes through all of them until it's finished. So we will see something that looks like this pretty soon, where we've got an interpreter, a pool, uh, and you have a, uh, a bunch of work to be done, and you can ask that pool to go and do the work. And it will do that in parallel. OK, so this is great. Uh, is it faster? Um, so this is, these are some graphs of my um, master's thesis, which included a whole bunch of work on testing sub-interpreters. Um, and the first thing I wanted to test is how long does it take to start one of these compared to the other options? So on my graph, uh, the axis is the amount of time it takes to the mean time to run it 100 times. Um, threading is by far the fastest to create a thread. Uh, Sub-interpreters uh, are slower by quite a large factor. Uh, and then multiprocessing is extremely slow. Um, so this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's used multiprocessing, um, but creating a Python process takes a lot of time. Um, but I think if you compare uh, threading, I've just used as a as a balance to show you what how fast threads are, but they're not actually parallel, so it's kind of irrelevant. Um, Subinterpreters are significantly faster to create um, than multiprocessing. Okay, so that's when you create one that does nothing. So in the second benchmark, I've asked it to calculate uh, pi, or someone corrected me earlier, it's actually pronounced p, um, to 200 digits, uh, concurrently 10 times on a four-core CPU. Um, and you'll notice that uh, threading uh, and subinterpreters are similar. And why is that? Uh, going back to the folding the piece of paper twice, um, it's because the job to be done isn't really big enough to see the benefits of the the gain of the parallelism. Um, so when I change it from 200 digits uh, to 2,000 digits, um, subinterpreters is, is faster uh, than threading running on a single CPU because the benefits of parallelism ha have kicked in. Um, so going back to our book um, timeline, so we had the packaging, the shipping, the unpackaging, and the reviewing. Um, the person one, CPU zero, then packages the second book and sends it off. Uh, and then they review uh, the third book themselves. So the question was, our editors enrolled a fourth person to review books. Would that shorten the time? Uh, the answer technically was yes, because you'd actually ask the fourth person to package the books, freeing up the first person to review the books. Um, that relates back to our Python example, because often you actually want one CPU to be dedicated to actually managing the tasks and not doing the work. Okay, so in Python time, in Python terms, you've got pickling, spawning, unpickling, and processing. Uh, and that's what that would look like in that case. Okay, so which option is best for you? So I've reduced this down to a couple of graphs. Um, now, if we have the size of task, so the amount of computation that needs to be done, uh, going from smaller to bigger, um, and then the time it takes to execute, uh, going from faster to slower. So the bigger the job, the longer it takes to run. Everyone understands that? So that's normal execution. Um, if it's threaded, uh, it takes slightly longer because you've got to create a thread, uh, but it's still linear. 
Um, that distance is the startup time. Uh, so with multiprocessing, the startup time is significant. Um, but if you had two CPUs, at some point those lines cross, could you get the benefits of parallelism? So if you compare that with subinterpreters, the startup time is smaller, therefore the benefits of parallelism kick in sooner. Okay? It's really hard to quantify what that point is because <laughs> the amount of work to be done is difficult to measure. I can't give you a number because it depends on the CPU, it depends on the architecture, like there's so many factors. Okay. Um, and when you add more CPUs, the benefits of parallelism make a bigger difference. Uh, so that line is basically at a different, uh, different growth rate. So if you wanted to reduce the cost of starting a subinterpreter, similar to multiprocessing, uh, you'd actually probably want to reuse them. So in this case, we've had um, you start one, it says it's ready, you give it a job, it gives you back a result. You start another one, it says it's ready, you give it a job, you get a result. Um, what you really want to be doing with subinterpreters and with multiprocessing um, is to reuse the same one. So once it's started, to give it a second job and keep it running in the background. Okay, so in summary, multiprocessing is a great way to run parallel work, but Python processes take a long time to start. Threading is fast, it's really fast to create a thread. Um, it's really easy to use them, but they aren't truly parallel because of the gill. Uh, Subinterpreters are a happy medium, and they're much closer to the startup time of, of threads than they are to multiprocessing. Uh, User-friendly interfaces and APIs should be in Python 3.13. Uh, so if you're hoping that you can use this right now, the answer is probably no, unless you are using it from a C API. Uh, the C API is usable, um, but the only types, there's a lot of caveats to that. Um, the only types that you can serialize and send to the subinterpreter is very narrow at the moment. So you can do floats, bools, uh, you can't do tuples, uh, you can't do dictionaries. Um, so the data that you can actually send to a, a subinterpreter at the moment is pretty limited. You pretty much have to pick, pickle everything um, and send it as a byte string. So that's kind of one of the big constraints at the moment is actually how you send the data and then how it sends the data back. Um, and the fact that you have to start them using strings. So uh, luckily in Python 3.12, you can do nested F strings so if anyone was wondering, why on earth would I ever want to do that? Uh, the answer is because <laughs> when you run uh, interpreters.run, the string can be an F string that contains an F string because the F string inside it is the code that you want to run. So there's a perfect use case. Um, low level libraries written in C um, need to compile in some support. Um, so they should test subinterpreters. So if there's anyone out there who maintains Python package uh, that uses the C API, I strongly advise A, that you test it on Python 3.12, uh, and B, that you test it with subinterpreters, because there are some changes. And I found that out the hard way. Um, so uh, here is the QR code with some links, um, copies of the code snippets, as well as links to the benchmark um, code, which is a Jupyter notebook, if you want to have a look at it. Cool, thank you. Thanks so much for the talk. It's awesome. Any questions from the audience? Anyone? I feel like this is going to be a busy one. <laughs> uh, the microphone's coming. The first question is from a C Python core developer. So this is going to be. Oh, this will be fun. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. This is a very nice talk. And as you comment, the sub-interpreter provides the limitation data exchange between the sub-interpreter. So, so it cannot using the, the data exchange of the multiprocessing way or threading way. So what do you think that, the, what, is, what will be the best use case for the sub-interpreter from the end user side? Um, one. I think if you've got a, uh, a, 
One workload that I've been looking at is uh, G-Unicorn. This is an example of, of what a use case I think would be effective. Uh, in G-Unicorn, um, there's different ways of running it. Um, a common way is multi-worker, multi-thread. Uh, multi-worker is a process pool, and then inside of that, you've got threads, uh, thread pools basically that sit in each process. Um, the other option is a Uvicorn, uh, which uses a lot of async. Um, you'd notice that a multi-worker, multi-thread approach to G-Unicorn, um, each Python process has quite a significant memory overhead. Um, sub interpreters have a far smaller one. Um, so my theory, and I'd like to implement this, is that you could write a G-Unicorn backend that uses sub interpreters, uh, and you'd get a lower memory footprint, uh, and also creating interpreters would be much faster. Uh, you do keep them running, so that benefit, I think, would more to be to do with like scaling around, um, but the memory footprint would be smaller. So it's a smaller memory footprint is one thing. The time to, to start them would be smaller. So the, it, I guess it comes down to the what is the work to be done, and is that work to be done big enough to see the benefits of parallelism? Um, in terms of serializing and sharing the data, there is a shared memory uh, interface. Um, it's just not finished yet. So the the serialization into that shared memory space, there's lots of different uh, types which need to be implemented. Um, tuples it would be a good example. So uh, floats and balls and things you can do at the moment. Um, but beyond that, it's quite limited still. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I think we're going back first and then we'll come back forward. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm curious about uh, how to coordinate graceful shutdown of uh, sub-interpreters when you have multiple threads running individual interpreters, for example, delivering signals from the main uh, program to shut down them or things like that. A very good question. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> uh, the exception handling as well is a big question mark for me. Um, yeah, like how if an exception is raised. I think it basically stops the interpreter and causes like an, almost like an exit code in that interpreter. Um, how you extract that exception though, I don't know. Uh, in terms of graceful shutdown as well, um, I, that is a really good question. I would love for somebody to test that. Like if you implemented a Dunder exit um, magic method on a type, would that get called from the sub-interpreter or the process? I'm just asking you questions now instead of the other way around. Um, <laughs> but yeah, good question. Thank Maybe you. tomorrow at the sprints we can try it. All right, uh, we've got time for probably one or two more questions. So up the front. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. So when we... Um, when eventually the, the, uh, the sub-interpreters are ready with the more user-friendly interface, would this be, should we all stop using multi-processing and shift over to sub-interpreters? I think so, unless there is something that really needs to be isolated in a separate process. Um, I can't think of any examples, um, but yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. Thank you. Did you do any performance comparisons between uh, this new way of running multi-threaded code in Python and just writing a straight up C++ function and then calling it? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, in the Pi example, yeah, C++ would be significantly faster. Um, uh, no, is the answer. I do have... Um, that is in my thesis actually is a whole bunch of comparisons with different uh, implementations. Um, and the summary of my thesis as well is that um, Python is getting faster, um, but in terms of how it impacts the scientific community, so much of the backend modules are now written in C and C++ um, that I think they are pr still pretty f effective and e efficient. The issue, the bottleneck, really is about how they can be run in parallel, um, and this is one of the things that would open that up. Thank you. Cool. So I think one more, just up the, up the front here. Wait, in front of you. <laughs> okay, that one will do. 
Uh, well, maybe a clarification. Uh, when you start a sub-interpreter, uh, does it start blank without any modules loaded, or with modules loaded, with your current code loaded, with your current variables and data already copied over? Like, what, yeah. what is actually there? Uh, okay, so it has its own state. Um, it has the, um, if you're familiar with site, the, the site import, um, it runs that. So it has the standard library, um, and it would also have access to modules that you've got installed in that environment, but it won't have those imports. So uh, it wouldn't have, um, yeah, it pretty much doesn't have anything uh, that the main interpreter would have other than the site. So the, it is actually possible it would be slow as a multiprocessing because multiprocessing copies, like it forks, so it keeps your current state. It doesn't fork anymore. Um, it used to, yeah. Uh, it has its own, and it also does the site import, um, and it has a whole bunch of other overhead to create, uh, basically spin up the memory allocator and a whole bunch of other things that subinterpreters doesn't have to do. Okay, that's uh, all we've got time for. Um, if you've got more questions for Anthony. Um, I've got a simple question. Uh, we, sorry, we don't, we don't have time at the moment. We've got to stay on track. Sorry. Catch him in the hallway afterwards, which is what I was about to say. So he'll be available whether he likes it or not. Okay. Um, so please, please ask your questions out there. And don't approach the stage, please. Thanks.